So no one's ever said to you, hey, where are you from? You sound funny. I don't think I have an accent, but I've been told I have an accent. A cup of coffee? You're drinking coffee. And eggs over easy. We all live in the same country. It's Nevada. Nevada. It's Nevada. So why do we sound so different? How much is a toe? How much is a toe? Toe, toe, toe. It's not like an accent, you know what I mean? Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah right. Oh, Yo, no. you betcha. If accents were borders, the states would look radically different. Bra. Bra. That was butter. This is brood. Better than good. It's brood. It's the history hidden in our map. How the states got their shapes. In this episode, mouthing off. Read this for me in your heaviest okay. Long Island accent. Oh, the Gettysburg Address. Yes. The guy behind you, he up, not, uh, way up there. Okay, he, yeah. He's the one who read it. So you right. gotta really, really give it all, give it your all. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready when you are. Four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. A new nation. A new nation. A new nation conceived in liberty. Conceived in liberty. And dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. All men are created equal. You know, as I've traveled around the country, I've met all sorts of people. And there's one thing I've really come to appreciate. American accents are all over the map. Out here, you've got the land without the R. And here, you've got the region of y'all. And out here, we call this the dude belt. Dude, what's up? Right, it's like, like, hey man, what's up, dude? Yeah, yeah. Right. Every place has its own ways of speaking. Can you guess which state these people are from? There's the Boston Common up to, here to the left. People lived in these small little um, townhouses. Down the shore. Everyone says down the shore, right. right? Totally. I'm so down. And what do you know? Here I am. How's those meatballs? Forget about it. Oh, yeah, sure. The hot dish. Yeah. You, the hot dish. Sure. Yeah. You betcha. Uh, have a few drinks. Have a few drinks. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Howdy, y'all. I'm fixing to go to the store. There you go. I've been in other parts of the country, and I've said, where's the bubbler? And they look at me like I arrived from another planet. You know, I'm from Ohio, so we, we, we really don't have an accent. I don't know. Maybe we should get one. In many ways, our regional accents define us and give us a very different way of looking at our map. Like this, from the Atlas of North American English. Linguists divided the country by accents rather than state borders. And they got some pretty interesting shapes. The center of our country might have the reputation for being a little plain, but it's rich with accents. There's the north, where they show just how far you can stretch an O. Well, we're from Minnesota, don't you know them? Vowels are a bit flatter in an area called the Midland. We're about 40 miles southwest of Peoria. The cities along the Great Lakes fall into another region. They call this one the Inland North. It includes industrial cities from Chicago to Buffalo. Most probably, I mean, there's... Oh, I just heard it. Most probably. You did? I, I did. did. So I said probably. Right, right, probably. See, it's nasally. <laughs> Look at the Northeast. It's full of accents. One city here sets the tone for much of New England. What did people say to you out in California when you were living out there? They said, Karen, say Harvard Yard. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would laugh. <laughs> so you moved out and there. And then they'd say, park the car. Uh-huh. And I'd say, park the car. And then they would laugh. So yeah, those are the... you can take someone out of Boston, but you can't take the Boston out of exactly, someone. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Not for someone who's lived here all their life. OK. Another colonial city, Philadelphia, anchors the Mid-Atlantic. Instead of water, Water. Water. Yes. And that's the Pennsylvania thing? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's not surprising that there are so many different sounds in the Northeast. Big cities here have long served as gateways for immigrants. Some of our founding fathers were even concerned that we'd end up speaking many languages instead of one. 
There always have been many languages spoken in the United States. In the 18th century, Benjamin Franklin complained that immigrants from the German-speaking parts of Central Europe refused to speak English, and they would teach German to their children. But Franklin didn't need to worry. Within a generation or two, most new Americans speak English without a trace of their ancestors' accents. Take a look at this map. It tracks which immigrant groups left the most descendants in each of these states. Germans dominate in Pennsylvania and many other states. French and French Canadians line the border with Canada. New Jersey and Connecticut have large populations of Italian heritage. African Americans predominate in parts of the South, and English and Irish fill New England. But these patterns don't match up with our accents. Despite what you might think, our ancestors matter less than somebody else who plays a much bigger role in how we sound. Our childhood playmates. To a large extent, dialects are pretty much formed by puberty. In reality, the hardcore dialect that uh, you had as a child and learn from other children, not from your parents, is the dialect that you're going to have throughout. So it's not your ancestry that determines your accent. It's the people that live around you. One region, more than any other, is virtually defined by the way it sounds. You know where you are the minute people open their mouths. My accent seems like to me to be just the way everybody talks. Do you, you do the y'all? Um, do you do we, the... Oh, we're definitely y'all. Mm -hmm. um, hey. It's not hi, it's hey. Fixin'. Fixin'. I'm fixin' to go to town. I'm fixin' to write a book. I'm fixin' to get on an airplane. Everything's fixin'. But what's surprising is that Southerners haven't always sounded this way. Research shows that before the Civil War, they sounded a lot more like everybody else. And the fact of the matter is that Southern English as we know it today largely developed after the Civil War. Because you really had a regional split. Many experts think Southerners started to sound different because it was one way that they could still be different. Even today, the Southern accent unifies this region. There's one phrase you hear all the time. Everybody says y'all. Y'all. Y-A-L-L, no apostrophe, I don't Nothing else gives away a Southerner so quickly. Y'all. Y'all. <laughs> Even transplants pick up the lingo. Y'all come and visit my house sometime, y'all. Y'all. But when you really get down to it, y'all and y'all, y'all and y'all, it's not so unusual after all. Y'all, y'all. We all say y'all in some form or another. You all? Lots of y'alls. <laughs> in the north, we use yous and you guys. And in uh, parts of Appalachia, from Smoky Mountains up through uh, Pittsburgh, you say yuns, you uns, which is shortened to yuns. Yuns? Yuns. Like yuns. Yeah. Like Yon, y'all, like, Yon, you all, and Yon's run Yons. together. Yeah. But the South is by no means monolithic. In fact, there are a couple of areas that preserve completely different accents. In North Carolina's Outer Banks is a tiny island that can only be reached by ferry, Ocracoke. Locals here preserve a way of speaking that sounds much like their ancestors, settlers who arrived here 300 years ago. It's like a lost form of English. Hoi toy on the sand soil, last night the water for night moonshine, no fees. People call this a brogue, but it's really just a strong accent. When I was in college, I, we had a tea to go to for the, um, for the president. I, well, I wanted to iron the dress, and I went to every suite in that norm, asking if they had an iron I could bore No, Nobody had an iron. Nobody had an iron. Couldn't find out everybody had one. They didn't know what I was asking for. They all had irons, but I needed iron. Farther south, in the low country and sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia, is another dialect. 
people here speak Gullah. Gullah, you speak it very fast. When under the day, the day, no under the day. When under the day, the day, the day. Which means when you are there, the day knows you're there. When you're not there, the day is there. When under the day, the day, no under the day. When under the day, the day, the day. It sounds like another language with bits and pieces of English. But Gullah also uses many African words and phrases. Ona is from the Igbo tribe in West Africa. Ona means, like, you all. Instead of me asking people, well, where are you from? I could say, where are you from? These two dialects sound very different, but they have one big thing in common. They developed on islands. The islands historically have been breeding grounds for dialect differences uh, because of uh, isolation and sort of a cultural detachment and so forth. I mean, it's really a matter of communication gaps. Which language, other than English and Spanish, do more Americans speak at home? Is it A, Italian, B, Portuguese, C, Chinese, or D, Vietnamese? Which language, other than English and Spanish, do more Americans speak at home? Well, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the answer is C, Chinese. Runners-up are Tagalog, French, and Vietnamese. Here is your first state to draw. Okay. New York State. Okay. No, all of it. All of it. Okay. All right. You're missing one part. What is that called? Manhattan. If this is Manhattan, then okay. you're kind of missing a part of the Empire State is easy to overlook. It, it's got island in the name. Am I missing this? Yeah. I have no idea. Long Island. There Long you go. Island. There okay. You go. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Long Island, a spit of land jutting out more than a hundred miles from the rest of New York State. Its claim to fame? It hosts the most widely imitated accent outside the South. Long Island accent. The yes. Long Island accent. I don't think I have an accent, but I've been told I have an accent. So you don't think you have one, no. but people tell you you have one. Correct. If people say you sound like you're from someplace else or Long Island, what do they say? Well, they say you sound like a real Long Islander. A Long Islander. Long Islander. Long Islander. And how do you spell Long Islander? <laughs> what about the, say, um, coffee? Coffee? Coffee. We are drinking a cup of coffee? You're drinking coffee. What did yeah. you say? Coffee. Okay, coffee. Coffee. How do you spell coffee? C-O-F-F-E-E. -F -F -E -E. That's coffee. How do you spell coffee? Oh, what, C-O-U-G-H-F? <laughs> okay, so where did this accent come from? Well, this is not an isolated island. Brooklyn and Queens are New York City's most populous boroughs. But it turns out for the first hundred years of our nation, they weren't connected to the rest of New York, city or state. It wasn't until 1883 that the Brooklyn Bridge closed that gap, connecting an island that still sounds totally distinctive today. The bridge may have brought Long Island into the mainstream, but now many of its citizens are ready to cut the cord again. They're the sort of people that don't mind mouthing off, and they've got a long list of grievances. Can Long Island be economically viable as its own state? If you just think alone of what New York, what Long Islanders generate in terms of taxes, the net loss to Long Islanders from what we sent to Albany, our state capital, versus what we get back is a little over three billion dollars a year. That's three billion dollars with a B. I mean, it's incredible. And literally, we're their ATM, we're their cash cow. Many Long Islanders seem willing to go along. <laughs> Do you think that Long Island should be its own state? Sure, why not? It'd be cool to be our own state. I mean, the taxes are uh, pretty high. Mm -hmm. Who should be the governor of Long Island when it becomes a 51st state? If it becomes a 51st state? Depends on who's running. Nico, what do you think? All the famous Long Islanders are going to run. All the famous Long Islanders? Yeah. I would. Alec Baldwin's pretty charismatic. He is. 
So you think you'd make a good governor of Long Island? Heck if I know. <laughs> One Long Islander has worked out the details, including the state capitol. I call myself the governor, more or less because I started this whole thing all together. What's the point in being part of uh, something that, you know, really makes you feel more alien than anything else? Everybody voted for Brooklyn as the capital of independent Long Island. Brooklyn? Brooklyn. The Brooklyn had mo the most votes for all practical purposes. You know what you also need, though? Mm -hmm. A flag. Yeah. And this is the independent Long Island flag. So this is it? The Long Island flag is an unfamiliar flag to most people. These four stars represent the four counties. OK, and those counties are? Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. And then there's a symbol in the middle that is like an eel's tongue. And that is, that's the Long Island flag. It's a nice flag. For all states that are in secessionist movements, they should know this. Apparently now you can just go on like the internet and you can sort of, you can be Betsy Ross, but you can like do it in 24 hours and they'll just ship it to you. Should we fold it the way it should be folded? Fold like this? Fold oh, just like so that. So some Long Islanders are raising their accented voices for political ends. Oh, okay. And that's what Alec Baldwin and an eel's tongue have to do with an island that could become the 51st state. The Long Island accent may be easy to mock, but like all accents, it's intricate and tricky to imitate well. How do you spell it? What, are you kidding me? Really? Really? You joking me? Totally. Sam Schwa has coached many Hollywood stars. He's renowned as an accent expert. The difference between a language and a dialect is a language has borders and an army. I'm hoping that Sam can teach me the fundamentals of the Long Island accent. Excuse me, Long Island accent. Now, I hear an accent that goes kind of like, you know, people order coffee, and I would like some toast with some butter. And uh, I don't know, critique me, if you would. I'd like some coffee, some toast. I'd like some coffee and some toast. And eggs over easy. Eggs over easy. Over. Over. Yeah. Over. Yeah. yeah. Eggs. Eggs over hey, easy. Make my eggs over easy. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> For somebody from Ohio, that is terrific. <laughs> <laughs> but not great. But I need a little work. Um, I wouldn't stop you at the border. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout the country, from Long Island, Long Islander, Long Islander, to the Great Plains, well, we're from Minnesota, don't you know them? We've seen that the states can be divided by how they sound. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but this raises a big question. In America, are accents an advantage or a disadvantage? Well, it depends on who you ask. The shareholders spoke on the telephone. Some people feel that a strong accent can hold them back in business. There is a shady group of people out there scrubbing America of its accents. They're called accent reduction or reducers, re, re, restruction or something like that. OK, officially, they're accent reduction specialists and speech pathologists. But whatever they're called, I had to see them in action. Our main goal will be VRT, the vowel reduction technique that we will use. Uh, I am brought into a room with a man named JD. He is uh, undergoing this intense accent reduction therapy. The issue here, from getting from southern to standard, is to shorten the vowel length. OK. I'm learning that there are two ways to say the word hope. There's hope and hope. Hope, hope. One is incorrect. Hope. And one is correct. Hope, hope, hope. The first one. Very good. And this herein lies the problem, is what is correct and what is incorrect. Very good, OK. So there actually are accent reduction consultants out there. But do strong accents really put people at a disadvantage? 
Some experts believe accents inspire pride and a sense of belonging. And something more, trust. So one of the things you'll notice on TV is lots of car salespeople speak in very regional accents. Come on down here to Los Angeles, New Jersey, and we're selling cars like candy bars. Local dialects tend to connote friendliness. We're going to make it happen for you. Trustworthiness, honesty. Two in once in Salem and one in High Point to serve you better. It's a ploy that politicians know all too well. It was very interesting to watch President George W. Bush. When he was campaigning in Texas, then you could hear the Texas twang. But when he got to Washington, it went away. And very often people who are in those kinds of positions, particularly people in public positions, they know how to turn it on and turn it off. Our first priority must always be the security of our nation. Uh, we got some priorities that we're in the process of working together to achieve. Priority, 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 priorities, priorities, priority, priorities. Again, vowel reduction technique to shorten the vowel. So while some people are trying to minimize their regional accents, others are just fine with the way they sound. Well, I'm a proud Floridian. I don't have any shame, and also I'm proud American. But I usually, because of the way I talk, people immediately say, where are you from? Are you from the South? Where are you from? It seems that for every place where an accent is in retreat, there's another getting stronger somewhere else. For example, the inland North Accent region didn't exist 50 years ago. It's the result of a change in how people in cities here pronounce their vowels. Caught and caught and bus and boss sound like different words in most places, but they're blending in cities here. I think there's a growing awareness and pride to speaking regionally in the United States. The fact of the matter is, whereas we talk about migration and how it's changing our identities, people are adopting local identity. So no matter where you start out, if you relocate to a new region, you might end up changing how you speak to fit in to your new home. This is how the shapes of the states change us. As we've seen, our accents reveal a lot about us. I get that a lot, that I sound like I'm from New York. But listen even closer, and you'll hear that it's not just the way you speak that gives away your origin. You can't be finer in Carolina. It's also in your words. You know drinks with bubbles in them? Yeah. What do you call them? Pop. I asked for a soda. Pop. Soda. Soda. Pop. Pop. I just call it a soda. A soda. It used to be soda pop, but that's too many syllables, so we just shortened it down to pop. Much of the time, the word you choose to use is determined by your place on the map. Want to pop? Then odds are you're from somewhere in the Midwest. Or in this huge territory that stretches all the way to Oregon. Prefer a soda? Then you're probably from the Northeast, the area around St. Louis, or California. But pop and soda aren't all we say. There are other phrases like soft drinks, and one that's almost disappeared. Have you heard of this tonic business? Oh yeah, tonic. That's an old, that's an old expression for soda. If you were to walk into a place and ask for a tonic, what would you get? I'd probably get something that had to do with my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, there's one part of the country that always seems to go its own way. What kind of Coke do you want? I'll take a Sprite. We ask for Coke. A Coke might be a specific brand name to you, but down south, it can be any kind of soda or pop. Why? Well, it's probably no coincidence that Coke's headquarters is in Atlanta. Using the word Coke helps tie the South together. We see the same phenomenon farther west, in an area of our accent map that's even bigger. We say dude. 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 Of course, not everyone in the West says dude, but linguists consider it one accent, as it has such a consistent vocabulary and sound. Language never stays the same. It's constantly evolving. 
and perhaps the most fertile ground for growing new words is right here in Southern California. Venice, California, the quintessential California scene. A beach lined with palm trees, a crazy scene on the boardwalk, and surfers, lots of surfers. As sports like surfing took off, spreading from Southern California into the cultural mainstream, so did the words surfers coined. Really laid back, you're not in a hurry, not trying to really push out any information on anybody. I'd get totally stoked. And for those of us who don't know what that word means, stoked, what, what, what does it mean? Uh, it means like hella puke. Right, hella puke. You use the word hella as an adjective, so like, it was hella sunny, it was a hella great day at the beach, there were hella people hanging out at the beach. Rad, gnarly, totally far out, bogus. These are some of the greatest hits of surfer speak. Words so vivid, they've entered the national vocabulary. In the 1970s, this part of LA was where bored surfers hung out between waves. In their spare time, they developed skateboarding, but once again, they did even more. Dave Carney is a skater and writer. The language police have found your fingerprints on the word bromance. I know, and I, I, like I said, is I, I, I don't think I invented the word, but I'm going to take credit for it anyway until the proper author comes along, <laughs> because I'm a writer, and having invented a word is, oh, it's is one, of the, yeah, one of the greatest uh, honors ever. Bromance. OK, guys, come on. We've all had one. I'm credited with saying it in, in terms of um, that's what happens with with dudes when they're on a skate tour, they end up having kind of a, a non-sexual bromance. Yeah. And it's an example of what you could call California speak. I'm wondering if that's what like separates California vocabulary from other places. We just kind of are just lazy and give up halfway through a word. Like, <laughs> don't feel like saying radical, I'm just gonna say rad. And <laughs> I don't feel like saying legitimate, so I'm just gonna say legit. And I think we just cracked it. We just cracked the code. <laughs> this is basically about taking polysyllabic words and making them monosyllabic. Or just mono. Or mon. We'll just, yeah. <laughs> what if? What if? There, you see? Nice. There's nothing like hanging out with skateboarders to make you realize just how dynamic our language can be. It's not like an accent, you know what I mean? Right, like it's, it's a like, full language? Yeah, like it's like ski you, and it's like getting each other's, I mean, there's like whistles and there's like hums and. Is it all part of the skater culture specific to that? All part of the skater culture, the gangster culture, the Venice culture. Rad, Rad gnarly. gnarly. Stoked, Marina. Bra. Bra. That was butter. This is brood. Better than good. It's brood. I think America needs to be put on notice. The word brood is about to take this country by storm. Brood? Brood. That's the new I made it up. I like it. I like it. Can I use too. it? You can everyone can use it. That's awesome. Take the note of that. Brood. I don't even know what it means. It's genius. Brood. The combination of butter and good. Well, brood's more like a solid, complete butter. Brood. Yeah, I mean, butter is just like the smoothness. Bread is the better goodness, smoothness, solid, finished draft of everything. Melissa, do you think that skating culture is gender specific at all? Do you think that it's just like some, that just guys, guys are into it, and girls have exported? I think we're done. Which is the only state that has two official languages? Is it A, California, B, Vermont, C, Hawaii, or D, New York? Which is the only state that has two official languages? The answer is C, Hawaii. On Long Island, New York. A cup of coffee? And in the South. We're definitely all. We've heard how the states got their sounds. They all had irons, but I needed iron. It's 
kind of amazing that with all these accents, American English is still even a single language we all understand. Nevada. Where? Nevada. Excuse me? Nevada. Nevada. Well, most of the time. For the record, the correct pronunciation, according to state residents, is Nevada. If you say Nevada, well, you're probably from the eastern half of the country. Forget about accents. The truth is, the two sides of our vast nation have always struggled even to communicate. It's part of our history. Settlements in the east were scattered, and once you hit the Mississippi River, it was wide open country. 150 years ago, the only way anybody could stay in touch was through letters. This hillside overlooks St. Joseph, Missouri. And in 1860, this was the furthest most western town. Beyond here, it was just frontier, eventually California. It was the end of the line for the telegraph and the train. So you can imagine how difficult and challenging communication was all the way to the west coast from here. So for a brief moment in history, the cutting edge of transcontinental communication was this. A pony. Let's go. We got some mail to deliver. It was our first revolutionary improvement in communication. The Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company. Pony Express for short. It took 10 days from St. Joe, Missouri to California. One way. Lightning quick for the time. If they had to travel by ship, it would take it a minimum a month to get from San Francisco to New York because they go down the Pacific and across Panama and up through the Gulf and the Atlantic Ocean. It was efficient, but very expensive. How long did the Pony Express operate? Well, it started April 3rd, 1860, and it ended in October of 1861. Uh, the last mail Wait, 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 1861, how many months is that? Well, that's uh, 72 weeks, uh, or uh, about 18 and a half months. Yeah. So they couldn't possibly carry enough letters to generate right. a profit? Not at $5 a half ounce, no. The Pony Express didn't change the way we speak, but big changes were right around the corner. Just two days before the Pony Express folded, a new technology was used cross-country for the first time, the telegraph. And like most innovations, it was spurred by people trying to make a buck. And if there was a new gold strike in California, that could mean millions of dollars for folks who are trading shares on the New York Stock Exchange. And the person who got the news first was going to be the one making the killing. With the telegraph, our language starts to change. If you're a telegraph owner, how do you keep a handle on the thousands of people wanting to use your new invention? Well, you charge them by the word. Individuals will, would only use this for, okay, the birth of the first baby, or grandpa died, or something like that. Enter Morse code. Clever senders invented new words and expressions, like SOS. Even today, Morse code is still evolving. Here's a new symbol, the at sign, the first edition in more than 70 years. Every innovation since has helped change the way we speak. Alexander Graham Bell may have invented the telephone, but it was Thomas Edison who first uttered the word we use to answer it. Hello. If Bell had his way, we'd be answering with ahoy. At first, telephones were few, so people's numbers were short. Phone companies used local two-letter exchanges with names like Beechwood, Klondike, and Sycamore. Butterfield 8 wasn't just a movie. It was a phone number. But the number of telephones grew exponentially, and the system got confusing. The solution, carving the U.S. into brand new shapes, area codes, 
We started off with fewer than 100 in 1947. Now, there are nearly 300. Ever wonder why area codes for big cities seem so simple? Well, that's because they were created for rotary phones. And the lowest numbers are the fastest ones to dial. The biggest cities got first dibs. Other areas had to spend more time dialing. So finally, with technology like the telephone, along with later additions like radio and television, Americans could hear each other's accents. And many of them were surprised to learn they sounded different. What's the accent most often written into a Hollywood movie that an actor comes to you, says, I need to learn this, help me? Well, aside from specialty accents that, uh, that, that are requested, such as British and French and the usual foreign accents, probably the most requested is standard American English, the accent without an accent, the invisible accent, the one that uh, makes people listen to what you're saying instead of to how you're saying it. Where do folks speak with this invisible standard American accent? Well, you might think it would be somewhere in the middle of the country, but it can't be found on any map. It's really only found right here, here. on television. It's the accent adopted by broadcasters and people who work in media. And if you didn't notice it, well, that's the idea. So that's how the Telegraph, Thomas Edison, and television help put words in your mouth. This is where history is made. Americans are a pretty chatty bunch. That's like an Italian here. Sometimes it's people slip the From state to state, we've seen that technology like the telegraph, Hello. telephone, and television impacts how we talk. Every innovation puts new words into circulation. And it's not over yet. LOL, anyone? Just like the telegraph, sending words from cell phones or texting puts a premium on brevity. Some of these abbreviations just stick in the brain, especially catchphrases like, oh my gosh, by the way, will they become their own words? LOL, they already have. The Oxford English Dictionary has recognized each of these words in the last few years. And there are others. Blogosphere, podcasting, here's a good one, ego surfing, TMI. With broadband internet crisscrossing the states, communication is instantaneous. But it still depends on your place on the map. What areas of the United States do you think lack internet service? The Google. You know what I'm talking about? If you're like on a plane, you yeah. know, at night, and you see like the light spots, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's like lots of light going on here. These light spots show where the greatest numbers of people live. Lots of light going on here. These cities and their suburbs have the fastest internet connections. But what about the places left out? Some of them are willing to do virtually anything to catch up. You know, you also drew today's weather map. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because there is a front on the east coast. <laughs> there is some clouds moving in on the west coast, some rain here in the southwest, and then some snow over the Great Lakes. Right, right, and there'll be some internet coming into Nebraska soon. <laughs> High-speed internet is kind of like the Pony Express of the 21st century. So how far would you go to get your town wired for the next generation of communications technology? In one case, the pursuit of an internet connection almost changed the map. Topeka is the capital of Kansas, the heart of the heart of the country one of those places that most people fly over and never visit. But when internet giant Google announced a competition to install an ultra high speed fiber network in a city, Topeka jumped at the chance. 
Topekans are making it known loud and clear they want faster internet from the huge campaign. Council members formally threw their support behind efforts to bring Google's high-speed fiber experiment to the capital city. So what's the best way to get a giant internet company's attention? How about changing your name? That's right. Welcome to Google Kansas. And they say they'll announce the winning community or communities by the end of the year. Topeka geographically is, is, is the center of the United Absolutely. States. Absolutely. You know, Walter Chrysler was from Kansas, one of the great car makers. The guy who invented the microchip is from a little small town in Kansas. I mean, there are great ideas and great energy here. I admire their vision, that they envision themselves as like a world leader in uh, innovation and technology. And even Google took note. On April 1st, they sent Topeka a sign. No joke, logging on to Google today brought you to Topeka, Inc., offering services like Topeka News and Topeka Maps. Instead of being Googled today, you were topeka -ed. Was it a good omen? Unfortunately for Topeka, it wasn't. Google revealed its decision months later. Google has announced one of the locations where it will install high-speed fiber lines. Google's winner was nearby Kansas City, Kansas. A disappointment for Topeka. But at least the citizens of this ambitious town don't get mocked for how they sound. All our American accents are here to stay, so we might as well just enjoy them. But before I hit the road again, let's put our experts to the test and find out how much you remember about language. On what New York island can you find the boroughs of Queens and Brooklyn? Manhattan? No. Well, there's Coney Island. Is it Coney Island? Is it Long Island. Long Island? Lord, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's where iced tea comes from. The Pony Express carried letters between which two states? Whoa. Alaska to Hawaii. Massachusetts and Philadelphia. Missouri and California were the only two states. Everything else was Indian territory. What state capital renamed itself Google for one month? Maybe we did it. Is it Sacramento? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I believe that was Kansas, Topeka. Topeka, Kansas, really? Topeka, Kansas, why? Kansas, never would have guessed.